Okay. Well, we are going to go ahead and get started. I know I have a few more people to log on, but um, we have with us today Mary and Lee, both um, who are board certified behavioral. What's the last word? Analysts. Yes. Um, and they work at the Cincinnati Center for Autism. So they are going to be both um, speaking together um, today on our presentation about externalizing behaviors and harming others. Um, and like I had mentioned, if we have questions, put those in the chat. We'll keep an eye on them, um, but we'll probably get to those at the end of the presentation. So Mary and Lee, whoever wants to go first, um, I will let you guys share your screen and we can get started. Alrighty, so I'm gonna pop my video off. I'm still here. My screen just freezes up if I have video and sharing at the same time. So, and while Mary's getting her video ready, I'll give you a quick little intro on me and then Mary can do one on herself. My name is Lee Morgan and I have been in the, I've been working with children for forever and I have, uh, I began my career as a teacher and I've taught everywhere from kindergarten through eighth graders. And then I decided I wanted to kind of go a different route in the education area. And that's how I then found myself with um, ABA. And I do have my own little test subjects at home. I have four kiddos ranging in age from 10 to 23. So I have been through so many different phases, stages, whatever, and somehow I'm around to tell about it. Um, and I promise, if your kids have done it, my kids have done it too, and probably in the most embarrassing situations. Um, so I feel for you not only as a parent, but you know, as, as an educator and teacher. But um, so yeah, they've they've been a wild ride. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Mary Mushaven, and like she said, I'm a BCBA, a board certified behavior analyst. And I've worked with a wide range of kiddos. So from young all the way up through transition age. And right now I am working mostly with our older students who are working at looking at transitioning um, and have some pretty significant needs for behavior. Um, I've done both more of a mental health approach and also through autism and other disabilities. So um, we're coming at you guys with a pretty wide range of experiences. So please feel free to let us know any of your questions and we'll be happy to address them. Alrighty, I'll get us started here. So we're gonna be talking about aggression and harming others. Those externalizing behaviors you might see that are challenging and can be disruptive. Um, so a little quick overview of the different things we're gonna chat about today. We're gonna start out with why is it happening? So this is the very first thing we're gonna look into and that would be the reasons aggression could be occurring. Once we figure that out, we're gonna move into skills teaching. So replacement and alternative behaviors that you might start to teach. We'll look at antecedent strategies. So those are things you're gonna do preventatively, proactively before behavior occurs to try and even prevent it from occurring. Consequence strategies. So those are strategies that are done after behavior occurs, so reinforcement. We're also going to talk about how to respond. So even with really great strategies in place, aggression or property destruction, those externalizing behaviors might still happen sometimes. So how to respond in the moment. And then we'll wrap everything up with a Q&A and hopefully we'll be able to answer everyone's questions and give you guys good pointers. So before we move into that, I just want to cover three of our priorities today. So every time we're moving to talk about working with individuals and potentially changing behavior, these are the three things that we really, really want to remember. And I have to shout out Dr. Greg Hanley and FDF Consulting, um, because they're the ones who first introduced this to Lee and I. And we've just really felt like it aligned with our ethics. So we wanted to pass it along with everyone else or to everyone else, sorry. Um, so number one, our priority is always gonna be safety. 
So is what we is what we are doing promoting safety? Um, and so sometimes we might do something that might seem a little backwards in the moment, but long term, it's because we're looking at safety and we really want that for both the individual. So your student or not your student, sorry, your children and yourself. And number two, dignity. So is what we're doing honoring the individual, your child and their rights? Are we respecting their self-determination? Are we respecting um, and honoring their wishes and wants? Um, so it's a really important question to ask, especially because we're trying to change behavior. And then the last one is rapport. So is what we are doing building our relationship or is it tearing it down? So it kind of ties in with safety and dignity, um, but it's just, as long as we keep these three things in mind, then we'll, we know we're gonna be making the best choice for our kids moving forward. Alrighty, so where do we start? And the very first thing when looking at externalizing behaviors is trying to determine why it's occurring. So questions you might ask are, is there a medical reason? What is the function of the behavior? Am I able to demonstrate functional control? I'll talk more about that last one later. Um, but first of all, just start thinking, why? And I know the slide, a lot of you are probably looking at it and saying, we've heard about the functions of behavior before. And so we're gonna move through it fairly quickly but we are gonna try and maybe give you guys a little bit more perspective on it and add a little more information than what you've seen in the past. So we all know that behavior is communication, right? Everything that we're doing is trying to meet a need or a want, tell other people something. And there are four main things that we look for. So is the behavior serving the function of attention, escape, access, or automatic? You might have heard a few different terms for that, but those are what those mean. So for attention, it's when you're seeking connection with others. Escape, seeking to escape, avoid or delay something. Access is when you're seeking to gain access to something tangible. Sometimes it's a place. And then automatic, sometimes called sensory, but you're seeking to either gain or alleviate a sensory sensation. There's a fifth one that people don't talk about as much. It's not like official in ABA, but um, people will kind of talk about power or control. So uh, um, people might engage in a behavior because they wanted, wanted to be in control of the situation. They wanted something to happen, even if it's not really their preferred thing, it's just kind of exercising choice. So if we all think about that, we like to be able to make our own choices. So. Um, you can kind of keep that in the back of your mind if you're thinking, oh, behavior didn't quite fit any of the four. It's kind of this untalked about side one. Um, and like I said earlier, functional control. So if it doesn't fit one of the four, that's okay. Um, so we'll talk into these, talk about these a little bit more. So that function behind behavior of attention. So I called that connection seeking. And I think that's a really good perspective shift, especially with externalizing behavior, because we might just think, oh, it's attention seeking, I'm going to ignore it. Um, but what attention means is that they're seeking connection. And as humans, we all need that. And it's thinking about their dignity, one of those priorities I talked about. So how can we meet that connection seeking behavior in a different way? So connection seeking behavior, it's attempting to obtain some sort of social interaction, right? Um, whether that's physical touch from someone or verbal interaction, playing a game, all those could be great examples. And this behavior works, aggression typically, because people respond to it right away. It's unsafe, it needs to be addressed, it's hard to ignore. So it's a very effective maladaptive behavior. Um, so when you're seeing that and you're trying to think about why is this behavior occurring, questions you might ask yourself are, what type of connection is needed? Why are they needing this connection? Could something be wrong that they're needing help with? So like I said, there's a ton of different um, types of attention, a ton of different ways to get connection with others and really trying to dive in and think, 
why are they engaging in it and how could I replace that, which Lee's gonna talk on later. So that next function of behavior that we're gonna check in on is escape. So that's when you're trying to, sorry, the faces are covering my slide here, delay something, escape something or avoid something. Um, again, aggression or property destruction is gonna work because people tend to stop placing a demand or remove it when aggression is occurring because you have to for safety. So again, very effective, um, maladaptive, but effective. Um, a question to ask though, if you're hypothesizing that your child might be engaging in aggression to escape something is why are they trying to escape? Um, so I really like this quote and I talk with my staff about it um, and it kind of frames this next slide. So it says, sometimes we get so focused on the child completing the activity that it becomes more about compliance than the actual skill. So to me, what this means is it's really thinking about in that moment when your child might be really frustrated about an ask that you've placed. So if it's um, homework or bedtime routine or something like that, um, is there anything we can do to help alleviate that? Do we need to make adjustments in the moment or plan for something different in the future? Because if is what we're asking skill building or is what we're asking um, just compliance for compliance sake? So think about that as we go and talk. Oh, there, a little too far. Okay, so we're still talking about escape here. And this is important to ask. So we're saying, okay, they're wanting to avoid this, but why are they wanting to avoid it? Is it too hard? Is it too easy? Is it too long or overstimulating? Um, other things could be, is it out of their current skill set so they don't know how? So it's just totally overwhelming to them. Is it too much of an ask? We've kind of jumped too far ahead in their uh, skill development. Do they have a past negative association with it or are they confused? Um, so for example, maybe it is that you're trying to ask your child to do some math homework at the table after school. And it's their first time seeing this addition and they're having to hold a pencil and holding the pencil is hard for them. And there's 20 questions to do. And so all those things might add up and then they're just completely overwhelmed. So maybe you could break it down and say, I'll hold that pencil for you. I can be your scribe and write if writing is really challenging. And that might take away the it's out of their current skill set. Um, and if it's too long, maybe you break it down. Um, so it's really looking at those sorts of things. Um, let's see if it could, if it was, um, maybe brushing hair, and that was really overstimulating because there's a lot of knots in it, then maybe breaking it down into small steps. So we're gonna do this part and take a break and come back. So it's really thinking, why are they trying to avoid this? And what could we change about that? The next function of behavior we're gonna talk about is access. This one's pretty common that we see um, with our students and it's, when you're wanting to access something or to continue to access something. Um, so again, it's aggression and property destruction are very effective, uh, maladaptive again, but effective because people will tend to comply and allow access to continue. So for instance, if someone's playing on the iPad and you're saying, all right, all done, it's time to move on and do something else and then they're scratching or hair pulling. Sometimes people will be like, all right, you can continue. I see you need more time. And that behavior is reinforced. Um, so it's when we're thinking about this, and again, this is gonna kind of be hard because we're viewing it through our perspective, um, but important to think about wants and needs. So in my mind, I might think that extra time on the iPad is a want, 
But for the child, that extra iPad time might be needed for self-regulation. That might be something that's helping them to maintain baseline throughout the day. So kind of putting yourself in their perspective um, and think about it. Just because they want it doesn't mean they need it, but it is important to view it through their lens. And another question to ask yourself at that point is, do they have an appropriate amount of access to preferred things throughout the day? So are they only able to get something for a very small amount of time? And then when they have to give it up, it's really, really challenging. So just things to keep in mind. And then the last one we're gonna chat about before moving on is the function of automatic. And that is sensory seeking or alleviating discomfort. Um, we tend to see this function associated with aggression and other disruptive behaviors, because when you're not feeling well and you want to alleviate that discomfort, it's kind of a natural reaction to externalize that and get attention from others or attempt to alleviate. So it works because it's gaining others' attention, who could help fix that? In these cases, I view aggression or property destruction as just a form of communication. Like something is wrong, I don't know what to do, I'm totally overwhelmed in my body. Um, it works because it gains that attention, but it can also provide sensory input. So if I have a really, really bad headache, and then I'm engaging in property destruction or potentially aggressing, my brain is unable to focus on something else and it's getting a ton of other sensory input. And for a little while, it could potentially alleviate that discomfort for me. If you're suspecting at all that it might be automatic, that it could be pain related or discomfort, look for medical variables and get consultation on that um, because behavioral interventions will not work. And then maybe you've heard this before, but maybe not. This is one of the things that we thought we could dive more deeply in on are synthesized contingencies. So some behaviors may be multiply controlled. That means that they serve more than one function. Um, I would argue that almost every single behavior is multiply controlled. So very rarely are you going to escape to nothing. A great example is, let's say I wasn't feeling like going to work. So I call in, I call off, and I'm escaping from my work day, right? I'm not just going to sit at home and do nothing. I'm probably going to do my preferred activities. I might access my favorite snacks and watch some movies. I may even go gain some attention and hang out with a friend. So I was able to do more than one thing. It wasn't just escape. What motivated me initially might have been I just couldn't handle that work day. I wanted to escape from it but it was maintained and continued on because they had access and attention. Um, it's also important to remember that some behaviors may serve different functions in different settings. This is especially true of aggression and property destruction. So just because I'm biting doesn't mean it's always gonna be the same thing. There might be different reasons based on the situation. And then, like I mentioned earlier of how there's the four and then kind of that fifth, which is that control. Um, if you're not quite sure what the function is, but you can reliably turn on the behavior. So that would be, you know exactly what could cause it. If you had a million dollars and you wanted to see that behavior and you could use all your resources and just turn it on, you knew exactly how to do that. But on the flip side, if you had all the resources in the world and you had to turn that behavior off, do you know how to do that? So what situations are gonna give you almost a zero chance of aggression? Um, if you know the answer to those two, what turns it on and what turns it off, then you're talking about functional control and you could use that then moving forward to design um, teaching scenarios. Um, this slide might be familiar too, a little overview before we move on. Uh, but once you discover the function or when you're attempting to discover the function, sorry, you're most likely looking at ABC data. So antecedent, behavior, and consequence. 
Antecedent is what happens before behavior. The behavior is what it looked like. And consequence is what happened after. So it's how people responded and what the child obtained by engaging in that behavior. But that very first one, motivating operation, might be new information to you. So a motivating operation um, is something that increases or decreases the value of a reinforcer. The reinforcer being what they're uh, attempting to obtain with the behavior. And it makes behavior more or less likely to occur. An example of that is hunger. So let's say I was really, really hungry and I asked you for my favorite snack and then I was told no, I might be more likely to engage in aggression then because I was just totally overwhelmed with that no answer. It's hard to hear no and I was hungry. So now I'm hungry and angry and it just kind of lose, lose control. Another common motivating operation is um, being tired, sleep deprivation. Um, it could be that after being at school a day, they worked really hard, which is great. You want your kids learning, right? And then they come home and then you have things that you have to ask them to do too. Um, and they're just like, wow, I've done work all day. I'm not ready. You know, sometimes I feel that way. Um, let me think here. Another motivating operation could be that they've not had their iPad all weekend because you were camping or doing something like that. And then they come home and they're like, I really, really want that iPad. So the deprivation of not having it makes it more reinforcing and more desired. That could change how behavior occurs. Um, so when you're trying to find that function, something that you can do at home, if you're not quite sure, you're saying it just feels like this behavior is happening sporadically, randomly throughout the day, randomly throughout the week. I have no idea why I'm seeing biting. You can make a little chart like this. There's a ton online. If you Google scatterplot, um, there's some that are really cheap on teacher pay teachers. Um, but what it does is it tracks the time of day or the activity. This one does both. And then when something occurs, you mark it in the box for the corresponding column and row. And at the end, so this shows a whole week of data, and then it lets you kind of look visually and see, are any of, is there a pattern? Um, are any of the data points chunked together in a certain row or a column? So when I look at this example, I see that the blocks for ELA are colored in, and that shows me that, hmm, ELA class, might be really challenging for the student. We're seeing a lot of behavior there. I also see that social skills has a lot of blocks colored in. So again, that's another pattern spot. Um, and that just kind of helps you to, again, dive in and see why is this behavior occurring? Um, it helps you to then inform how you respond. So once we've discovered why the behavior is happening, now what? Hopefully I move through that quick enough as a review, but not too quick that you had too many questions. So I will pass it off to Lee here. Perfect. Um, and Mary, are you still going to click ahead for me for the sure thing since you have access? Okay, cool. Next slide. All righty. We are going to teach new skills to our, our kiddos. That way we can give them a substitute for these behaviors that they're displaying. It's time to unleash your creativity. Think of your kiddo, but if you are creative in any aspect, now's the time to get creative with things. Teach to empower, not teach to control. One is rooted in love and the other is rooted in dominance. We want our kiddos to advocate for themselves. We want to teach them these skills so they can do so. We don't care about the, are you complying? Are you doing what I wanted you to? No, we just want them to be the best version of themselves that they can be. And by teaching them these new skills, they can be a better version of themselves. Okay, so we're gonna think back to the functions that, um, that Mary talked about. 
for these replacement behaviors, they need to match the function of the maladaptive behavior. If someone is biting for a whatever function to get something, we must teach them a replacement behavior that will get them access to that item that they want. We want to find something that is safe and more socially acceptable way to meet a need. Is biting socially acceptable? Only if it's food. Uh, it's not nice to bite your friends and we're going to lose friends that way. And we want our kiddos to make friends, make connections. And so we do want to teach a socially acceptable way. Um, with the biting others, give a chewy, something like that. Ask for a break to delay school assignment instead of hitting a teacher. Socially acceptable ways. For this replacement behavior to be effective, it needs to be easier than the maladaptive behavior, quicker and more reliable. Otherwise, long-term success will not happen but we want the response effort to be less so the child will use it more effectively. They might think it is easier to immediately hit a teacher to escape something because their language skills are not where they could be. We might wanna just have them sign help. We just need to think of something quicker, easier that they can do instead of that behavior. So replacement behaviors for attention. We need to think of it as Mary did say, connection seeking, because yes, they do want our attention, but what they really want is to form a connection with someone else. They want to be around someone else in a positive manner. So what we need to do is to teach them how to get someone's attention. Did I love it when my daughter would chew on the cord while I was on a telephone call to get my attention. No, there are much safer ways of doing that. Um, come hold my hand, come do something else. A friend might hit another friend in the hall because they think this friend's cool. They're into the same Hot Wheels cars that so-and-so is. Instead of hitting them to get their attention, let's teach them how to tap a shoulder how to say, excuse me, something productive that would help them forge a connection rather than breaking one apart and having them looked at in a negative manner. The reason we want to do this is so that they can continue to develop relationships and friendships. And we need to model that as well. That's one thing that we forget to do is model appropriate behaviors and tell your child as you're doing it, look, I'm so excited to see so-and-so. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk up, tap them on the shoulder. And even if you feel silly doing it, it makes it more real to them. And it makes them feel, oh, okay, mama struggles with it too sometimes. She's nervous, but this is what she's going to do. Um, so very, very important to to do that, to model it. And the last part, consider including the individual's interests. There's buy-in if you are using an item that your child likes. Um, for example, your child might hit someone all the time to get their attention, but they're really into dinosaurs. We can start off with letting them have their dinosaur poke the person that they're interested in talking to because what starts off as a little poke with a dinosaur, they can roar, they can do whatever, it'll get their attention in an okay manner to let them know, hey, I like dinosaurs. And that the poking of the dinosaur can later be shaped to hold the dinosaur in one hand, poke them on the shoulder with, the, with their finger. So think of their interests in a way to get buy-in. Dinosaur wants to get their attention. Dinosaur is going to poke their shoulder and say hi to them. This is what dinosaur is going to do. So definitely you'll get more buy-in, especially with the little kiddos, if you find their favorite item. And then when it comes time to escape, this is when we see a lot of issues happen because we have, we do a very good job of teaching our children to name items, especially favorite items. But what we forget about is, oh no, what if they need a break? We 
don't realize it until it's too late and we've already let them build up these bad habits. I'm guilty. I did it with my own kids. I forgot to do that in the beginning. They would get a bad habit and great, now I need to break this habit. What do I do? Um, so main thing, it's never too late. We need to teach them how to ask for a break, how to ask for help, how to be finished. Um, because when there are long assignments or a challenging activity, sometimes it's maybe if their language isn't quite there, maybe they can't say, I'm overwhelmed because of this packet that the teacher gave us and I'm freaking out. Um, I'm already tired. What can they do instead? Help. You can just teach them a quick little sign sometimes. And the response effort to that would be a whole lot less than to go in the whole explanation of why they're feeling the way they are, what they're trying to run away from. Um, so you could also get uh, little break cards. They, you can Google those and it's sometimes helpful to keep in your pocket or your purse to make it even easier. So you don't have to look for it. Tape it on the kitchen table, tape it wherever they are frequently and they do their homework. Um, that way they can just tap the break card. And so what you want to do with these things is you want to practice when they're in a good spot. You want to practice where, while they're doing a fun activity and say, oh, it looks like you might need help. Help. Ask, yes, how can I help you? And be so excited when they do ask for help or ask for a break, but remember to make it easy, quick. The response effort should be so low. Um, that way, when their emotions are already high, they really don't have to think all they have to do is tap the break card or do something like that. Um, and another thing, some kiddos don't wanna leave their activity. They, even if they're frustrated, they might become more frustrated by leaving the activity, by escaping from it. And so sometimes regulation strategies work. For me, massaging my temples. I know I have work to do, I can't leave my work, but I massage my temples. And that's a self-regulation strategy. I can click a pen. <laughs> I know it probably annoys Mary, my office mate, but there are times where I click my pen, take the pen cap off and on and off and on, but it's my self-regulation strategy. It calms me down so I can keep working. Uh, but like we did talk about, remember the why. Why are they escaping? Are they escaping because there's too much work? Are they escaping because they just need a break? Are they escaping because they don't feel good? Do they just need help? Um, so we really need to think of why and then give them, this is the, if I could say, pick one of them right away, teach them this first, teach them how to ask for help, teach them how to ask for a break in the easiest way possible. And you can de develop it later on. Um, and it might be helpful also just to show them a break card. You're frustrated here. Here's your break card. Go, go take, take a few minutes. Um, okay. So. I've talked a lot about that. You can tell I'm passionate about that one. Um, another one is how to get something. They don't know the proper way to get something right off the bat. We, If I see chocolate, I might climb over a table to try to get chocolate. I might throw some elbows to get what I want. Not really, but um, some of our children do. They see that iPad that they have not had access to all day. They want the iPad. They will rip it out of their sibling's hands. They will push their sibling to the side to get that iPad. Our job is to teach them iPad. I want iPad. We have to think of what their communication needs are or their communication level. If they have trouble, um, especially when they're frustrated, using vocalizations, let's give them a picture of an iPad on a, like a choice board. What are their most common items that they really want? iPad, TV, um, a fidget. And that way, all they have to do is point to the iPad. That way they don't have to push or hit anyone to get what they want. Um, and then another one we do need to teach with this is we can't always have what we want when we want it. And that's hard. Uh, so we need to teach self-regulation strategies 
to use while waiting. We want to model these when the kiddos are happy. We can start with a, we don't want to start right away with if iPad is their most preferred item. We're not just going to start with, hey, let's practice waiting with the iPad. No, <laughs> we're going to start waiting for a non-preferred item, a mildly preferred item, and start when they're happy and just pull something out. Oh, you want to wait for, for a cup. Here, let's wait. One, two, and you want to give them strategies to do while waiting. This song is not available that you want. What can we do while we wait for that song? We can stretch, we can sing, we can play with another item, but we want to teach them waiting skills. Not everyone has them and waiting is harder for others, but this is when you wanna get creative. Um, think of songs you've never sung. If they like dinosaurs, see how many dinosaurs you can list until it comes to um, their time with their item. See how many times they can jump up and down, snap fingers, touch your nose over and over, sing head, shoulders, knees and toes. Do, oh my goodness. Um, let me turn down the volume. Um, but so this is when it comes to be creative about what you can do while you're waiting. But definitely teaching waiting is important because we can't always have what we want right when we want it. And replacement alternatives, replacement or alternative behaviors for when you're sensory seeking, that's hard because we don't know exactly what is going on inside of our child. We wish we did. Uh, we can only guess that teething pain is really painful for them because of the tears and the anguish they look like they're in. We do know headaches are painful. So if we see our kiddos squeezing their head, um, we might assume they have a headache. So the, the way we can help with that to the best of our abilities is teach them how to squeeze, teach them deep pressure, offer chewies, um, asking them, teaching them how to ask for help and telling us what hurts. Sometimes um, our kiddos are not able to express to us what hurts because they don't need, they don't know the body parts. They don't know how to say it hurts. Um, so we do need to, I'll touch on it later, but we do need to really teach that, teach uh, body parts, but really be careful of, uh, it could be a medical need. So definitely um, see what medical needs there are. If they are teething, that, that can be taken care of. But if they're biting a lot and they've never really bitten before, it could be an ENT issue. It might not be aggression or it might not be an intentional aggression. It's because they're in so much pain. So definitely do consider medical needs. Antecedent strategies, that means what can we do before behavior? Well, we don't know when a behavior is gonna happen. We can guess because you may have done your scatter plot or you know that every time right before lunch, my child is getting all upset, getting angry, or maybe it happens right when they get back from school or it happens before transitions. What can we do to set them up for its success? What can we do to help them be the best version? What we wanna do is give them countdowns. Um, not all of our kiddos know numbers. And so maybe a sand timer will help. When this, when this sand is all gone, that's when we're going inside. When the number gets down to all zeros, this is when we're doing whatever. Uh, let them know that's how we're going to tell when we're doing what. Um, another one, we have some kiddos that it gives them the power. They feel they are in charge and they get to tell my Apple watch. They get to say, hey, Siri, set the time for two minutes. And then when they hear my watch go off, they're like, oh, Siri's telling me to go. And it's nice because it's not me telling them. They feel they're in charge because they're the one telling Siri and Siri lets them know. Um, visual schedules. 
our, our children forget they're young. Um, even the older ones, I forget it's, it helps having a schedule, just how we have our calendars and we have our life scheduled out. The more concrete we are with our children, the more they know what to expect and they won't be so scared to go to the next activity because they know, okay, I'm doing this right now. And then I have to do math, which isn't my favorite, but ooh, after that, I get to go to art. I get to do an art project. So visual schedules help to let them know what comes next, what comes after. And that way it won't make going from one place to another such a mystery. Uh, including choice. When you make their schedule, give them the four things they're expected to do when they come home from school. Cool. Let them pick the order. You can say dinner is going in number three spot because I already have the food in the oven, but let them pick the order. Do they want to have a snack first and then do homework? Or do they want to wash the dishes and then put away their shoes? Give them an order or let them pick the order of things. Lay out what needs to be done, but let them pick how they want to do it. Let them pick how they want to transition. Do they want to hop like a bunny? they want to slither like a snake. As long as they get from point A to point B, it doesn't matter if they walk or ride a tricycle, they're getting where they need to be. And give them a choice of how much longer they get to stay at the playground. You can stay for five more minutes or seven more minutes. Which one? That way you're okay with both answers, but let them pick. That way they feel in control. And that way when the timer goes off, they're like, okay, I, I made that choice. Transition objects. Along with the visual schedules, sometimes it's hard to walk from one place to another because you're worried about what might happen there, or I forget what it's look what it looks like. You might want to give them, give your child a small picture or an item that goes with that location. If they get to go to, um, if it is bath time and then story time, Give them an object, give them a, their favorite bath toy while they're eating dinner and say, okay, what comes next? Give them their bath toy. They can run to the bathroom with their bath toy. They know where they're going. After bath, give them their book. We're going to bed and we're reading our book. That way they know what to expect and what the expectation is of them. And consider motivation. Is We all have a hard time of going from our highly preferred activity to something we don't want to do. I would much rather watch Netflix, go on a bike ride, than fold laundry. So I try to pick something that's okay in the middle to get me to that point. I'm not going to go from my favorite activity to something I dislike. Otherwise, I'll just sit there and make excuses. So we need to think about what will help them along the way. Let's find highly preferred to medium preferred activity, then the least preferred activity. And work demands. Our kiddos have to get things done. We know it. This is where we have to model once again. We're gonna go back to a choice. Here's what needs to be done. I have to vacuum and I have to do the laundry. Which should I do first? I'll do this and then do this. And then say, you, you are doing these two things. Which one do you want to do first? If you pull yourself in with them, they'll realize they're not alone. Sometimes it's fun to take a silly dance break before you start. If you know you have a long homework assignment or a challenging, if you have to write your name and pencil grip is hard, take a, a finger wiggle break first. Be silly with your kiddos and then sit down. Role play, how I said with modeling. Oh my goodness, I'm so frustrated. I forgot how to put this dish in the dishwasher and I really wanna throw it on the ground and break it. And say that in front of your child and let them know, oh, I can ask for help, help. Get someone else to come in and say, here's how you put it in. So really model you asking for help also and include the interests of the individual. If your child really loves folding washcloths, Give them the washcloths to fold it laundry instead of all the other stuff. Pick out their favorite part of every activity. Let them do that part. It'll, it'll get buy-in and you can get some behavioral momentum going. And then 
giving no answers. We don't like to be told no. Our kids do not like to get told no. We can give them empathy. We can say, it's hard. I get it. Validate their feelings. I know you're sad. I know you're angry. I know you're frustrated. I'm that way too. And then give them other choices. No, we cannot play the iPad right now. It's dead and I don't have the charger. But here are other options we can do. We can color. We can dance. We can go for a walk. Um, and then let them know when the activity will be available. Once I get the charger out of the car and we plug it in, give me five minutes. Or when this timer runs out, we will be able to play your iPad. That's when it'll be charged and ready. And once again, practice those waiting strategies. Waiting is hard, but let's practice them when we're in a good place. They might have been playing the iPad for three hours straight. Practice waiting for the iPad for five minutes. It's, it goes back to the MO, uh, the mode of invading operation. If they've been on the iPad for a while, they're probably okay to practice waiting for it then. Relinquishing preferred items. Think about, put, it, put yourself in this situation. You're playing on your phone, scrolling through social media, looking at TikTok, laughing away, and someone comes and takes your phone. We would panic. We think, oh my gosh, they're going to screw up my apps. They're going to close me out of things. They're going to lose my passwords. It's really going to be upsetting. That's how our children feel when we take items out of their hands. They might keep hiding them from us because they're worried that we are going to mess them up or do something. It is much easier when we place our phone on our bedside table to charge or we tuck it in a drawer because we know it's safe. No one's gonna hurt it. If you want your child to give up an item, get a neutral something else. Honey, I know it's hard to give up your iPad. Let's put it in the bucket. Let's put it in this bin. Let's tuck it in this drawer. No one will touch it. It will be safe. Here's how much longer we need to let it sit there and give them that timer. And then, Give them something to do while they can wait for it. No, you can't have it right now because we're eating. So let's eat. What can we do? Dinner conversation. But do validate that it's hard, but it is very hard to give it up to another person. So just make sure there's a bin or something, and then we're going to put it in the bin in three, two, one. Let's go. But definitely do a countdown. Don't just snatch. It's, it's not fair. We have to think of it from, from our perspective or from their perspective. And for attention, think ahead of time. I have an important business phone call. I have uh, someone coming to fix the overflowing toilet. If you know that ahead of time, Figure out what your child loves the most. How do they love to play? And give them that time devoted ahead of time. Give them as much attention as they need in the interaction they want. If they like playing with markers and lining them up and they want you to line up markers with them, do it. If they want to sit a car on a dinosaur's head, and sit there and watch it tick tock back and forth, do it. Don't say this is not the way to play with that item. This is not this. Immerse yourself in their world, in their interests. Model or uh, yeah, model their same or reflect their same energy level. Act as excited as they are. Give them that attention. That way when you have to do what you need, they're okay with that because they've gotten enough of your attention, enough connection with you to where they're okay. And let them know, mommy is going to play with you for 30 minutes. We can do whatever you wanna do for 30 minutes. And then mommy has to be on a phone call until this timer runs out. And then I can give you more, more attention. We can make connections, we can play and name what you are going to do with them. We can play, we can do this, we can do that. That way they know, oh, undivided. 
And when you do show your child attention and you are there, undivided attention, put your phone down. I know I love TikTok. I love all that stuff. Looking at it, it's fun, but put it down. Not, I'm just going to check one more thing. They know, kiddos know if you are giving them attention and making a connection with them, or if you really are preoccupied with something else. And then let them practice getting your attention. Excuse me. Tap, tap, tap rather than chewing on an electrical cord to get your attention. And sensory. If we know there are going to be fireworks, if we know we are going to take our child into an overstimulating environment, what can we do before that happens? We know our body's gonna, that our child's body is gonna get all out of whack. What can we do before? Are there headphones? my child can wear to take away the ear sensation that they're going to get, the, the loud noises. Are there colored glasses they can wear? Um, are they fine with a tight skull cap that they put on? Will that make their head feel better? Is there a weighted vest that maybe you could talk to an OT about? But definitely consult with your occupational therapist for what is right for your child. Um, most importantly, this is where I am big on, teach body parts and body sensations. We might have children who are absolutely miserable howling. We don't know why. It is something inside them. We don't know if it's a stomach issue. We don't know if they hurt their knee. And some of these children are not very good with uh, vocalizing and verbalizing things. And the more we can teach them about their body, anatomically correct body parts. Once again, anatomically correct body parts, teach them those based on body sensations, whatever. We put food in our mouth, mouth, tap mouth. Um, if they have a headache squeeze, I'm squeezing your head. Your head might hurt. You might have a hurt in your head. Really go over body parts. That way, later on, if there is a sensation inside of their body that is going on, they can communicate it. Even if communicating is patting on that part of their body that hurts, if they're patting their belly or patting their knee, they are communicating to you. They are letting you know what part hurts, what part needs to be fixed. And so definitely, definitely body parts. All righty. So that's everything that you might want to do preventatively. So hopefully we're not even seeing aggression or property destruction, any type of externalizing behavior at that point. The reality is that we might still see some. Um, so consequence strategies, but that doesn't mean punishment. I know consequence tends to have that um, connotation in everyday life. But what we mean here by consequence is something that's happening after behavior. And in our case, we're talking about reinforcement strategies. So we want to provide reinforcement when desired behaviors are observed. All of those replacement behaviors Lee just chatted about. So using your chewy, asking for a break, um, gaining someone's attention by tapping them instead of punching them on the arm. Those are all really great behaviors we want to see. So we're going to reinforce that. That could look like high five, great job, thumbs up, uh, fist bump. It could look like honoring that request. So they said break, and you're going to reinforce that by removing the work demand for a little while. So, hey, you know what? You asked for more time on the iPad before uh, bath time, and you did it safely that time. So you can have a few more minutes. Thank you for doing that. Um, I have here try to use natural or logical reinforcement. So it um, kind of makes sense with the situation. So in that instance, I just described if they ask for more time and you gave it to them, that's naturally occurring. Um, it's likely to be maintained in the future by people who aren't specifically trained in how to respond. Um, another example would be um, if they use the words to appropriately ask for something, that they got it. Um, and you reinforce that functional communication. Um, it's important to remember that that reinforcement should be immediate. 
So when we make connections between our behavior and the response it caused, that connection is stronger when that response happens right away. So if they ask for something, try and respond and honor that request right away if it's something that's available. You're allowed to say no, but if you are able to do it, go for it right away. At least acknowledge that they said it. Maybe you have to wait to go grab it, but you can say, hey, I heard you. Thanks for asking and using your words that time. That was awesome. And it should also be appropriate in size. So if asking for something is really easy for your child to do, they've mastered that, maybe they're older, um, you might not give them everything and the kitchen sink when they ask. You might say no at that point in time because they're able to handle it. But if asking for a break from work is huge, typically when you ask them to maybe help out with chores, they respond by throwing things in the kitchen and breaking dishes. That's a really big maladaptive behavior, right? So if they ask for a break, respond hugely. If they safely said, um, I'm not ready to do that. I need to take a break first. Big social praise. Wow, that's awesome. You're a rock star. Thanks for using your words. You can have a break. And then once they're calm and ready, return to that demand. Um, so match that size with how challenging it was for the child, how challenging it was for them, not for us. Because we might say, it is so easy to ask for a break. Just ask for the break. It's not that hard. But for your child, that might be asking them to climb Mount Everest. It might be really, really hard. Um, let's see here. It's also really important to remember and think about, is what I'm offering a reinforcer or is what I'm offering a preferred item? So I know that I hear a lot of people sometimes saying, we're still seeing this behavior even though I'm rewarding with their reinforcers. And I might ask, well, what are those? And they list them out. I'm like, that's awesome. Those are really preferred items that that person really enjoys. But if it's not changing behavior, it's not a reinforcer. So um, I'm thinking about um, maybe you're asking your child to climb out Everest and it is to complete their whole bedtime routine. It's brushing their teeth and getting in the shower and putting away all their toys. And we're offering um, social praise at the end of that. And normally they really like that. They love getting high fives from you. But in that instance, what we asked is bigger than that reinforcer. And so it's a preferred item at that point. And it is not a reinforcer. Or even if it was iPad and they're saying, you know what, I really like my iPad, but it's not worth it to go through my whole bedtime routine. Um, so like Lee said earlier, it's time to be creative then. So how can I rearrange their preferred items. Can I think of anything else that might um, be effective as a reinforcer and actually increase that appropriate response? Um, you can play around with your motivating operations then. So maybe iPad is that reinforcer for following that bedtime routine or for transitioning away from the playground if that's what they really like. And so before you do that big ask for them, maybe they don't have access to the iPad. So that way, when it's like, okay, it's time to leave or it's time to do your bedtime routine. When we get back, you can have iPad. You're like, oh, wow, I've not had iPad in so long. I really want to do that. So then you're more likely to see that safe uh, behavior that you're hoping to see. Um, consequence strategies can be tricky um, because it is dealing with um, reinforcement and post behavior. So if you ever are seeking some more in depth or individualized things on that, I really recommend talking to someone like Lee or I who has training in that and who can help guide just to make sure that everything's staying safe and all on the up and up. Um, so Lee and I have given a good amount of strategies there and those are awesome and fun and dandy. But then what do we do when aggression does occur? Because even when things run perfectly, um, we tend to still see problem behavior sometimes, especially when you're first intervening and trying to change what behavior looks like. So the very first thing is regulate yourself first. I saw a quote one time that said, regulate before you educate. I love it because it rhymes and it sticks in my head. 
Um, it is so true. But if we're wanting to change behavior, we have to be calm and we have to be in control of ourselves so that we can think because it's really challenging. I know that when I'm seeing aggressive behavior or property destruction, I have about a million thoughts running through my head all at one time. And I'm trying to think, how can I respond safely in this moment so that the child stays safe? Because they're your child. You want them to be safe and happy. How can I stay safe? And how do I keep everyone else safe? And how do I keep my house from being destroyed? Um, so take a deep breath. Use your positive self-talk. Remind yourself, I can do this. I am the best parent for my child. I know my child. I am my child's expert. I'm going to figure this out. Um, because you guys are. You are your children's experts. And you are the best people to be their parents. Um, check in with yourself. Ask yourself, how am I feeling? Am I being triggered by what just happened? Am I thinking about something that happened in the past and I'm associating this? Maybe last time I started to see this behavior, it spiraled into a really big meltdown. So I'm feeling really overwhelmed. Um, how is your child feeling? It's important to remind yourself that because sometimes it can be a reality check. So um, are they feeling disappointed? Are they feeling hurt? Are they feeling scared? Um, remind yourself, how are they feeling? Another really important one is how is the environment impacting the situation? So are you able to change anything to support safety or de-escalation? Um, are siblings around? Is it a good idea to get siblings out of the room for their safety and also just to remove audience? Um, are there things nearby that maybe I should move so they're not throwing and breaking? Um, could I make the room less overstimulating to help support regulation? All great questions. Um, and then finally, it's okay to tap out. Um, Lee and I have done that for each other at work and we've been in the field for a while. Um, as parents, you guys are in this all day, every day. It's okay to need a break. It's okay to say, um, right now, I am not in my best space to be regulated and guide my child through these really big feelings. And I will say with that, um, with my teenagers, I have tried to model appropriate behavior for them. And there are times where we start to lose our mind um, because teenagers do things that we probably did as teenagers ourselves and we don't want them to do that. But there are times where I've had to look at other adults and I've said, please take over for a moment because I can't do this. If I do it, I'm going to do, I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to be not the best person I can be, which is not going to help my child. Look to a neighbor, look to a friend, look to your spouse, look to a babysitter, but it is okay to say, I can't do it right now because that makes you human. You are okay. And you are a better parent for it. Yes. Thank you, Lee, for adding that. Um, okay, so now what, what are we doing if we're seeing this aggression in the moment? Um, I thought about why the behavior is occurring. I tried my antecedent strategies and the choice, all those sorts of things. It didn't work. We're into this now where I'm seeing some hitting or some throwing or biting or whatever it is that you're seeing from your child. If it's mild or isolated, you have some time to think because um, major safety, hopefully, isn't at risk right now. So what we're wanting to do is to really label and validate your child's feelings. Um, validation is so important. It's what we as humans all really need. I know that when I'm upset and I'm validated, it instantly helps me. Um, it's not going to be a little magic thing that's going to turn the behavior off, but it does just show your child that you're respecting them and their dignity. Um, provide that empathy. I know, buddy, it is so hard to put your iPad down. It's really hard to stop doing the things that we like. I hear you. Um, you can let them know that you have a hard time with that too. Um, it depends on where your child is at with their receptive or expressive language skills, um, how much story you want to put behind that empathy, but it's showing your child that you're relating to them. Um, and then Again, when it's mild or isolated, you can prompt that desired behavior. So maybe um, I said, okay, bud, 
iPad's done. It's time to get ready for bed. And the child reached out and, and tried to scratch or hit to get you to go away and have more iPad time. You can prompt that desired alternative behavior. So, hey, it looks like you're angry. I hear you. It is so hard to wait or to put away things that you really like. You can always ask me for more time. So you're prompting them to say more time or whatever that is, that desired behavior, and you can honor that request. It's okay to then also say, not right now. That might be something that you do later on after your child has um, mastered that skill of using that functional communication. Um, it is also okay in that point in time if more iPad time is not an option. If you're like, it's nine o'clock, we're already late for bed and I'm gonna have to get you up for school in the morning. No one wants you tired. Um, you can prompt that desired behavior of, hey, here, you're really upset, you want more iPad time. Put in bin or wherever it is that they put their iPad. You can model that desired behavior. Um, so let's say um, you're prompting them to come to dinner or to leave the playground. You could have someone show, hey, look, your sibling, Joe just went over there. He walked to the car. We're going to do that too. Come on. Um, it kind of helps show what is supposed to happen in the moment. Um, things that you should be thinking at this time is, like I said, um, environmental changes. What could you do to help support success? So um, if they're starting their bedtime routine and the first thing is to brush their teeth, could you bring the toothbrush to them? So like Lee said, could they then carry the toothbrush to the bathroom? Or maybe brushing teeth is really aversive. Maybe you're gonna start with changing clothes first, bring the change of clothes to them. Um, it kind of lowers the demand a little and meets them where they're at. You can also think, ooh, should I be adjusting my expectations right now? Um, I have a little caveat here that this works best if foreshadowing of what's expected has not occurred. So if you've already said, um, let me think here, uh, we're gonna do um, two worksheets of your homework before you go out to play, whatever it is, they know that you've said two, I would, Kind of, if, if you're able, stick to that. But if what you said was, we're gonna do a little homework first and then you can go outside and play. Um, in your head, you might've thought, we're gonna get all this homework done before they play. But you're starting to see some signs of frustration. You might lower that expectation. And after they did that one worksheet, honor that. They don't know that originally you wanted them to do too. So they didn't escape anything. Um, and you're just gonna kind of meet them where they're at. And then maybe again, later in the afternoon, evening, you go back to that homework. Um, same thing with the bedtime routine. Maybe they do part of it and take a break um, and then come back to it. It's important to remember that there will be more teaching opportunities in the future. So if you need to in the moment for safety, reinforce something that's not so desirable, it will give you then time to plan and strategize for the future and try and prevent that from occurring again. Um, we've definitely had to do that at school, so it's okay. Don't feel like you're making a mistake if you need to do that. Um, okay, so now what do I do if that aggression is really intense or it's continuous, so it's not stopping? Um, we're gonna focus on de-escalation. So learning cannot occur during crisis. Um, I, I'm going to say that again, learning cannot occur during crisis. So if your child is super escalated and it's just a whole meltdown, um, your focus is trying to get them calm again. So you're validating your, their feelings, you're prompting the desired response or self-regulation strategies. You're going to give them time and space if possible. Um, assess what is needed for safety. So like I just said, you might consider reinforcing in the moment so that you can regroup and plan for the future. It is important that this would occur infrequently. If not, all we're doing is reinforcing the aggression, but um, sometimes it needs to happen so we could figure out how to shape that behavior further. Um, it's really about 
just de-escalation. So I have a few strategies here, um, physical proximity. So that's either being close or giving space. You know your child. So sometimes being close to your child might help them to calm down. It's very comforting. For someone else's child, that might be very triggering. They're like, whoa, back up. Um, a caring gesture. Again, know your child. So would a pat on the back, would holding their hand, um, a head rub, would that help them to calm down? Or is that more likely to put you in danger and increased aggression? Hurdle help. So that would be helping them to do whatever that desired task is. Um, it's important to limit spoken direction. So when we're escalated, our brains have a hard time processing and receiving language. So you would use short prompts for the desired behavior and really short directive statements. You could also use visuals. Um, again, you'll manage that environment. Do siblings or um, a partner need to be removed from the room? Um, you're gonna maintain a calm, neutral demeanor. That can be challenging. So that's when you might think about, if I'm not able to do this, this is my cue to tap out. Uh, provide choice and provide time. Under providing time here, I have lead off emotions. It's kind of a strange thought to have, but if your child is speaking and maybe they're yelling and cursing and um, making a lot of unkind statements in the moment because they're in crisis, that isn't the time to stop and correct it. You might let them continue and you can say things like, I hear you're upset right now, you're validating. And once they're calm at baseline and everything is, is safe, then you can teach to, hey, that language wasn't appropriate. Next time we can talk about those sorts of things. And that's when you can really teach. Um, you know, we're getting closer on our time here. So that's what we have prepared. Um, and we'd like to really just open it up for questions now. I know we had a few that were sent in. Um, so just wanna see how we can help people. Thank you guys. I will stop the recording also now. Um, and then you guys can feel free to ask any questions that you have. <laughs>